for he only had me and big and companies. you only had him and i only time. had him <laughs> absolutely um how shattering an experience was that to go through well it was it was it was incredible because everything crashed with it because i i had foregone uh, salary for a year and i had pawned everything i had for him and I was left, literally, when I say without a penny, I really mean it. Therefore, even I, I had, I could have had work, but I simply couldn't afford a pianist. I couldn't afford to rehearse for six weeks without pay, because in those days, very often you rehearsed without any pay. I simply couldn't do it. I had nothing to eat. So I gave it up in one fell swoop and went as a cook first and then as a secretary. Secretary of the BBC? <laughs> yes. Among other places? Yes, opposite Kensington House, opposite where I live. But you were still singing, weren't you? Well, the BBC gave me a lot of engagements without realising that I was doing secretarial work for them. So you would arrive in the morning as Miss Vane, working as a secretary for the BBC, and come in at night as Madame uh, Vane. That's right, having done the, a prom. The opera singer. <laughs> I know, it's extraordinary. You were leading a double life, in a sense. I was, you? really. Yes, I was. <laughs> Madness. You had but to it sign all, on? It all seemed awfully banal at the time, you know. But fairly <laughs> extraordinary now. Well, now I think it is amazing because I used to get a contract from the BBC. It was always six weeks in advance. You'd get a contract to learn Les Nos or whatever, the, the death of Cleopatra. It gave you six weeks to learn the part and for me to perfect my voice because I may not have sung for two years because I never sang in between. And so I would, in six weeks, I would have to learn the part, do all the interpretation, and perfect my voice, which was a challenge, which was wonderful, really. But gradually the engagements became fewer well, and yes, fewer. Well, yes, because I had no agent, and uh, the BBC gradually just faded out. And in 1965 you decided... 1965 was my last you very decided big to rush give it recital. Up. Hmm? How hard was it to just push it to one side and... Think, well, well for about ten years, I lived, I suppose, in a sort of a, an anesthesia, really. I was an anaesthetized, I suppose. I often got up in the morning and thought I couldn't live through the day, but one did. For about ten years, and then I accepted. The thing with life is that you have to accept whatever comes, then you can live with it. If you fight it, you can't live with it. And I learned to accept. But you went to see a psychic, didn't you? And the well, psychic... I've had four psychics in my life. Uh, they came to me mostly. I mean, I'm not a religious person. And one of the psychics told you something about your voice? You? Well, the, one of the psychics at the beginning of the 60s told me that when I was at the end of my life and my voice was just a memory, my voice would, re would be reborn. And I assumed that that was some, on a spiritual plane, probably at my death. But I always remembered because it was terribly vivid. She went into a slight trance. And uh, it's happened. I mean, it's word for word, it's happened. Let's talk about how it happened, because this was 1990, really. There were two people involved. 1998 it started. Really? There were yes. two people involved, two people who the really one. promoted you, managed to... Yes get hold of your recordings That's and right. take them to Vienna and get you a contract. That was Earl, Earl Oaken, yes. Earl Oaken, who was an alternative comedian. Who was an alternative comedian, a wonderful, wonderful person. Tremendous. I, I don't think that it's anything bad I could dream up about him. And He's he believed in generous. you? He had believed in me, but he simply didn't know what to do about it. And the first thing he did was to put an article in the record collector magazine and that sort of started the whole thing then he went to Vienna for his own gig and uh, showed Prizer my discs and Prizer had never heard record of me. company record company one of the biggest collectors record company and he listened to it and he said I've ne I don't know who the hell she is but she <laughs> belongs to the greats and so he made the two CDs which I mean I was in a state of panic I was panic-stricken that I would be absolutely, you know, obliterated by the criti critics. Instead of which, they suddenly, for the first time, heard me sing. 
as I had been singing all that time. <laughs> How gratifying is that? After all the ups and downs, as you said yourself, you sat for 40 years, basically not doing mm. very much. Well, it, it's wonderful. I mean, it's wonderful to know that I was right, because there was a period in my life where I really felt that I had failed totally on the strength of not having really a good voice. I accepted that because it was the only thing I could do. You didn't believe live. in yourself. You were too insecure, were you? Yes, about your own I was, abilities? I was very, very insecure. Always. But that's gone now. No, I'm very secure. I'm quite aggressive now. <laughs> <laughs> and you hold master classes I from hold time to time. Classes, yes. I'd love to do more. <laughs> How much fun is that? Oh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to be able to even. A, a really good voice, there's still something you can give. I, I believe in coloration. I think that it's like a huge tapestry on which you paint sounds. And I think that that's a wonderful way of looking at singing. What do Light you look, and shade. What do you look forward to? A peaceful death. <laughs> <laughs> a bit more than that, surely. I'd love to do a one-woman show. That's my dream. Really? And what mm. would you sing? Sing, I would talk. I would talk. I would talk about my life. I would. I have thousands of anecdotes which are hilariously funny. And yes, I would sing gypsy songs. Yes, I'd love that. And what about going back to Russia again? No, I, do, I wouldn't see the point. My great niece is coming with her daughter in April. No, what's the point? Russia is coming to, to you instead. Yeah. You said, and we mentioned this at the beginning, that you'd finally found out who you were, who you are now. Yes, I, I, found, I, I found my identity, which I don't think is given to everyone. How I didn't have an identity before. How important is that? I think it's very important. I think it's very important because then you can assert yourself. You know and, become, I mean? and become one of those pushy performers. Uh, mm. <laughs> no, that I don't think I ever will. <laughs> <laughs> I leave that to them what can. All right, Kira mm. Vane, it's been a great pleasure having you on the program, hearing your memories, hearing what you look forward to as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.